My name is Malik Kabazda. Welcome to PM Express. Quite recently, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank, i.e. the Bank of Ghana, cut the policy rate from 25, from 23.5% to 22.5%, what the bankers call 100 basis point. This is not the first time that the Central Bank is doing this. It did this not too long ago, cutting down the policy rate by 200 basis point. What does this mean? Why are interest rates in Ghana insanely high? Why is it that compared to elsewhere in Africa, when you borrow money from a bank in Ghana, the interest you pay on that loan is absurdly high? I have somebody who will answer all these questions when we come back from the break. Keep watching. Yeah, welcome back. You are watching PM Express. And today we are talking about the decision of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank. By 100 basis points, that's by 1%. I have somebody who will answer questions as to what is the relevance of these cuts? Why was it not cut by a larger number of basis points? Why was it not cut by, say, 10% or 20%? Why just 1%? My guest is the head of finance at the University of Ghana Business School. He's an economist. Professor Godfred Buckman is our guest today. Prof, welcome to PM Express. Thank you. And... When I hear 100 basis points, 1%, monetary policy, please break it down for us. What do we mean when we talk about monetary policy? Okay. Essentially, if you, if you pick any economy, there are two major policies that shape the economy. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the physical policy or the physical side. Okay. In the, the government has control in terms of revenue and expenditure. Okay, that's how much money we get, how much how money we, we spend. spend. That's the a fiscal, okay. In that side and the efficiency in that side. Okay. That is one side. Fiscal side. policy, okay. There's another important aspect also, which we call the monetary policy side. Mm -hmm. And the monetary policy side is under the control of the central bank. That's the Bank of Ghana. Yeah, or, yeah Bank of Ghana. Okay. Independent of any influence from government or any other authority. Okay. So Bank of Ghana is independent. Okay. Okay. And the, 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 the framework is also done that beyond being independent, they also want to ensure their operational independence also. Okay. So what does Bank of Ghana do? One key thing that they do is monetary policy. Okay. In our part of the world, okay, we operate a dual system. The Bank of Ghana regulates the market mm -hmm. in addition to monetary policy. Why is it regulating the market? What does that mean? Supervision okay. and all those things. Okay. Okay. So, and then other market activities. But okay. elsewhere, there's a separation okay. from purely monetary policy conduct. Okay. And then market regulation and supervision is also done separately. Okay. But for us, everything comes under one umbrella. Bank of Ghana. So now, you realize that um, monetary policy is equally important for our economic growth mm -hmm. because in terms of when it comes to interest rates, inflation, all those things, uh, the monetary side plays a critical role. Okay. So for instance, the Bank of Ghana meets every other week practically under the new monetary policy framework that was formally uh, uh, adopted in 2007. Okay. okay. Even though we started the somewhere 2002, mm -hmm. but formally we switched to what we call inflation targeting okay. in 2007. So what they do there is every other week they meet, they evaluate a lot of data on the economy, the real sector okay. through the, what they call the composite index of economic activity. I mean, I mean it's just an index. My that, directors and cameramen are lost. <laughs> okay, so composite it, index, okay. real economy. <laughs> and yeah, so when we talk about the real sector mm -hmm. of the economy, we are basically talking about activities as it relates to agric okay. industries and okay. their service. Okay. That is what actually drives the, actually economy. the economy. And normally when we talk about GDP, it comes down to just the real sector. Okay. Okay. Agri, industry, and then service. Yeah. But under each of these, we break them down into sub components. Okay. But when we talk about agri alone, we have livestock, we have crops, we have mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. now, so we realize that through monetary policy, uh, we, we it's, it's basically about using interest rate, uh, money supply, credit, and all of that to influence economic activity. The overall goal of our monetary policy has been price stability. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so, okay. Now. so that's why you see it is inflation targeting, targeting. because inflation is the rate at which the prices of yeah. goods and services yes. go up. Yeah. Okay. And then when we talk about price stability, generally it goes beyond inflation also. Okay. Oftentimes people think that inflation targeting is only about inflation. Okay. But price stability so includes exchange rates. Okay. Also includes interest rates. Okay. Other, so how much yeah. can I, how many CDs do I need for, to get the yeah. dollar so you know or the pound? The central bank is not solely concerned about inflation, but we also be concerned about exchange rate stability okay. and, and then uh, uh, interest rate also and all of that, even though there's a pass through of exchange rate depreciation, okay, to inflation and then uh, uh, interest rate. Where do you set in this argument about inter, um, exchange rate, mm. there are those who think that the city's value is artificial. Do you share that view? That in, in, on its own, the city should... should be depreciated. Yes, the, that a dollar should be six cities or even seven cities. That well, the four point whatever cities is artificial strength. Well, from where I see, um, I don't think that the city is overvalued. Um, in fact, if you look at it historically, since its introduction, mm -hmm. the city has lost uh, approximately 99.99 percent of its value. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, so except that we can't get to 100 percent because mathematically, once mm -hmm. it's not, yeah, it's not possible. You differentiate something by 100 percent. What this what have we done right? wrong? Yeah, it, it, the, it, the problem is not the CD itself. The CD is just a reflection. Yeah, so it's we who have done things wrong. Yes. So the CD is only giving you signs as to the real issues that we are not focusing on. Because your CD would, would be stable or would appreciate or depreciate, largely reflecting the fundamentals of the economy. And when we talk about the fundamentals of the economy, we are talking about the real sector here at Greek industry service comes mm -hmm. in the game. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you are not doing work in terms of your Greek, you are importing everything and exporting nothing practically, certainly you will need more dollars so when to Bawumi, meet your import bills. So when Bawumia says, if you do propaganda with the economy, the exchange rate would expose yeah, you, yeah, he was you, right. You can't do propaganda with the exchange rate because you don't have control directly over the, over the exchange rate. It's the forces of demand and supply. If you remember about three or four years ago, uh, Bank of Ghana used to keep their rate artificially mm -hmm. low, low yeah. from the market rate. Yeah. And they were exposed because the, the reality is that it's the forces of demand and supply. You may be able to do propaganda about other things, but hey, when it comes to the exchange rate, you will be exposed. So you don't share the view that the value I, I, of the I, CD I, is artificial? Yeah, I do, not, I do not go in that direction because you have to be able to provide empirical evidence. And from the nature of my profession, that is not our calling. Our job is not to speculate. You should be able to provide some empirical evidence that if it is not this, then what is it? I mean, you can't say that two plus two is not five if you didn't know it is four. So you should know what exactly it is, and then you can say that once it's not there, then it's this. So okay, so let's go back to monetary policy. Yeah. And quite recently, the central bank, the monetary policy committee cut the rate yeah, by, um, 100 basis by 100 basis points. Point. Yeah. What does that mean? Okay. So, um, the central bank, like I said, will meet, the MPC will meet every other week. It will look at all the data and all of that. In their conclusion, it comes down to just two things, inflation and then growth and how to manage the trade-off. Mm -hmm. So when they assess the risk from the global, regional, sub-regional, then the economy itself, mm -hmm. they, are, they, they may conclude that the balance of the risk is towards inflation, meaning that the threats of inflation going up is higher mm -hmm. than maybe the threats from growth. Okay. Then if that is the case, then they will increase the policy rate to contain the threat of inflation. Growth. And once they increase the policy rate, what this means is that it's going to make borrowing difficult from especially the private sector. Okay. And then the cost of borrowing will also go up. Once that happens, demand for loanable funds will also will go, go down. Go down. And once that happens, what it means is that uh, in terms of the amount of money that will chase fewer goods or something would also go down in terms of tightening uh, credit. Because people the, don't have yeah. disposable, people don't have a lot of and money. A lot of, a lot of money. And liquidity. those who want to also borrow to actually expand it would also be a little bit more difficult for them. So they would do that. But if their understanding 
is that the balance of the risk is more towards growth, meaning that we are more at risk of miss, missing our growth target mm -hmm. compared to the threat from inflation, then they will lower the policy rate. And once they do that, then it means that they are courting growth. Now, once, once they lower the policy rate, what it means is that the cost of credit and the availability of credit will now be the focus. So chances are that the cost of credit will come down. Now you realize that once the cost of credit comes down, it will motivate businesses and even individuals mm -hmm. to, to demand for more money because the rate has, what, has gone come down. down. Then they can expand or fund consumption or production or whatever. So for instance, as we speak right now, almost a quarter of the world's GDP, they have negative interest rate. Do you know what that means? It means that in those economies, interest rate is practically zero. That means if you go and borrow money, yes. you pay back the same amount yes, that you borrowed. Yeah. You don't pay anything yeah. on top. And if you have to pay something, probably 2%. So if you borrow 20,000 Ghana CDs, yes. you, borrow, you pay like 200 CDs on, on, top, on of top of it. Yes. Not even 2,000, 200. Yes. So it's, it's as low as that. That is why globalization makes our firms uncompetitive. Because there's someone in China, there's someone in Japan, there's someone in the US, in Europe, in Sweden, who could borrow at let's say 4% and will still do business and export it to Ghana here. And the price will still be cheaper than the firm that is in Ghana, takes raw material from Ghana, borrows from Ghana, hires labor from Ghana. Then it means that that, that firm in Ghana will not be competitive. You were talking about the reasoning behind the decision to say cut the policy rate because they are looking at risks and determining that well it's uh, more towards this or maybe downside risk to growth or upside risk to inflation is that not more theoretical rather than practice because when they cut this policy rate we know that before this one the last monetary policy action was to cut the, uh, the, the monetary policy by 200 basis points. That's about 2%. Yeah. This, the recent one, is by 100%. Yeah. So cumulatively, over the past five, six months, is the, the monetary policy rate has been cut by about 300 basis points. That's about 3%. Yeah. Has there been a corresponding cut <laughs> in interest rate from commercial banks? Okay, that's, that's another layer. That's another layer. The reason you may not see that uh, available. <laughs> okay, the transmission mechanism of the monetary policy to the real sector itself is also another dimension, mm -hmm. which I believe the central bank is equally concerned and is also looking at. So the transmission mechanism is also affected or enhanced or constrained by the regulatory regime, mm -hmm. by the efficiency of the market. And when we talk about the efficiency of the market, we are looking at the extent to which security prices, it could be lending rates, it could be other prices, mm -hmm. adjust rapidly to reflect the arrival of what information. Mm -hmm. So if security prices or the market does not adjust rapidly to reflect the arrival of information, then you realize that the transmission mechanism mm -hmm. of this uh, monetary policy to the real sector or other uh, variables in the economy will not be as the theory proposes. What is different with us that makes this transmission such a Herculean challenge? I'm asking this because mm -hmm. elsewhere, when Donald Trump was elected as president of the United States, we saw the markets react. Yeah. When um, Emmanuel, Macron, Emmanuel Macron was elected as French president, we saw the markets respond. Yeah. Why is it that our banks do not respond immediately or quickly when the central bank takes actions such as the Well, let's understand it. You know, in economics, there's a very beautiful statement. Every student who did Econs 101 mm -hmm. came out of the lecture room with that statement, all things being equal. All things must be equal <laughs> okay. for certain things to be equal. So our things are not equal. Well, I won't go <laughs> in that direction. But this is what I'm saying, you know. Mm -hmm. If you look at banks' uh, base rates mm -hmm. and then the formula, which is the central bank has approved the formula for the banks, mm -hmm. which they use in determining their base rate. Mm -hmm. In that formula, there are a number of variables. There are some, or indirectly, that the central bank has control over. over. There are a good number of them that the central bank doesn't what, have control over. For instance, when it comes to operational costs, costs. which is annualized in the formula. 
So if the cost of operation is high, is very high, the banks are not NGOs. Central they bank can cut them. their policy rate to whatever level. Yes, they, the banks will find enough reason why they cannot pass on directly or with that a commensurate cut. cut to the ultimate customer because they are looking at other world variable. That is why we say that when you see the monetary policy is also done or conducted or a decision is taken with respect of the overall economic management strategy of the government. So that's why you are looking at it holistically. So the point is that whilst the central bank is looking at what they have control over directly or indirectly, we are also looking at the physical side also taking shape and doing what is supposed to, what to be done. We are also looking at banks also exploring efficiency in their own operational activities. Because there, the central bank doesn't have control. <laughs> yeah. If you are supposed to have five staff and you have seven, I mean, it's not the job of the central For bank. For what I say, is there, is there value then in these cuts? There, there is. There is. Where does it lie? Yeah, because well, what it means is that once this is sustained, we are not there yet. We are not there yet. So we, we, we can say that. Why are we not there? We are not there. Why? You, you just told me that cumulative. Over the last uh, four months or so, we have had a rate cut of about this point. Elsewhere, this was only then the policy rate was maybe five percent, and if you cut it by three hundred basis points, you are talking about two percent. Two percent, yeah. <laughs> but it's even, massive. Yeah, even ours with the three hundred basis point cumulative, we are around twenty-two point five percent. Is that not high enough? And that but leads. That's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. If you are a manager, a chief executive of a bank, finance input cost is just one variable you are looking at. There are other variables. Mm -hmm. The cost of maintaining a presence in certain areas in Accra is so expensive. You understand? Because the whole Ghana, excuse me to say, is just about Accra. Yeah, that's true. There's a high concentration in the capital. It has implication for rent. It has implication for transaction cost, and all of that. If you put all these things together, it's very difficult for you to be efficient. The banks will be very happy with you because no, you are telling their story. I'm going to come to them. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because the point is that, mm -hmm. you know, because of transparency and all of that, disclosure of information and all of that, there is a genuine reason why banks must respond. Even if it's not that significant, it's important. It's important in generating confidence in the system mm -hmm. for which the banks themselves are beneficiaries. Okay, so I'm, my understanding is that we've, we've seen in the last couple of months some of them revising their base rates. Okay, but the difference also between the base rate and the ultimate lending rate mm -hmm. comes down to individuals' own uh, specific risk and all of that. So whilst we talk about the central bank doing their part and the banks also doing their part, we also expect borrowers, customers, to also do their part by maintaining proper books, okay, and by being attractive. Okay? So the higher your risk, yeah. the higher the interest sure. at which you are giving yeah, a loan. Precisely. In fact, there's a reason why we say that the poor on the average end up paying more than the rich for the same service, because the rich is more attractive. You know what the rich will do? They are likely to go to the wholesaler and ask for a discount. The poor, you know where he will go? He the will retailer. Go to the retailer and buy it. The last the chain of the retailer. Yeah, so he's going to pay for the profit margin of the retailer in addition to the wholesaler. The rich person has avoided all of that. And the rich person, because of his wealth and his, his, his rating, whatever, has a stronger bargaining power and can ask for a reduction. You cannot. Let's talk about interest rates in Ghana generally. In my readings before this show, I found out that as of um, 27th March yeah. this year, interest rates in Kenya was 10%. In Ivory Coast, just next door, yeah. their interest rate is ranging between 4.5% 4, 4 to 3.5%. That's interest rate. Ivory Coast. Yeah. Why? Are interest rates in Ghana 29, 30, 33 percent? Yeah, it's simple. It's insane. Well, it's a matter of choice. It's a reflection of our actions and inactions over the years. I'm not blaming anybody. This is Ghana's own situation. You will find that inflation is low in these countries. 
inflation is high here. Let me give you an example. During the, the oil price shocks, let me put it that way, <laughs> world oil price came down significantly. Yeah. You know the effect of that in these countries? It, they pass on those gains the benefits. to the customers. It, fuel is an input cost. So it lowered their input cost. They also pass it on to their consumer. Do you know what that would mean? Inflation will come down. In Ghana, you know what we did? We held it up and slotted in yeah. the energy sector. Energy sector le levy. Yes. yes. Probably government had a reason for doing that. The outcome is what we are seeing and what other countries also have. So there is no substitute, essentially, for doing the right thing because it's cheaper to do the right thing in time zero than to correct it a year or so later. That has been our problem. So if you look at the, uh, the fundamentals of our economy, we are not on the same level like Kenya, like Cote d'Ivoire. That's the fact. Cote d'Ivoire? Yes. Why? If, if you look at the ease of doing business today, you'll be surprised that some companies actually relocated to Cote d'Ivoire because, look, okay, don't go too far. Do you know how much you pay for electricity in Ghana? compare that to what somebody pays for electricity in Cote Yes, we heard the president complain about companies having to pay 42 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, and when companies next door are paying far less. Precisely. You know why that is so? Cote is not essentially subsidizing electricity there. The reason is simple. Because we are inefficient in our electricity generation, transmission, and distribution, we tend to pass it on to the customer. So we pass the inefficiency, yeah, the politicians will say incompetence. Well, but I will not use for, that. for this discussion, <laughs> <laughs> Let me, I, I will be safe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and per the nature of my profession. So, so we pass the inefficiency yeah. on to the consumer. Yeah, and that reflects in higher prices. And that also makes us uncompetitive. Okay, so there are a number of factors. So, for instance, not to do politics, um, you find the posture of the new government taking on all these things. Beyond that, we also they're also talking about institutional effectiveness. And I've particularly been happy with the approach the vice president has adopted. Mm -hmm. He takes on state institutions. He visits them. Yes, we saw him at the Register General's Department, uh, uh, the ports. Yeah. 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 And then passports and of, all of that. Yes. He brings them to the public limelight. Let's discuss. What my understanding that he would expect an appropriate response from these institutions that things have changed. And I've, I'm, also, I'm also happy to some extent, it's, it's early days yet, I hope they will be able to sustain it. Government comes out with a position, with timeline. They are telling you by September, we want this out. Yeah, they want to remove all barriers on the roads. And so that when you are traveling to Paga, yes. there are no these yes. SEPs barriers, every barrier they will yeah. stop. That, that is a shift from what we used to see in the time past, where politicians would say, we are working on it. We are working on it. We will do something about it. Do you know, now, what this means for journalists and all of us is that one month from now, or from September, as they have said, we will go. We want to see the barriers removed. If they have not, we come back to those who gave us that assurance. You said this. That hasn't happened. And those who said that because of their credibility, they will make sure it happens. It happens. Not directly, but they, their own team would, would follow up that we give this deadline, give us a report before the media gets to my office <laughs> and, and all of that. Okay? So what it means is that, you see, unlike in the time past where accountability was essentially enforced by those horizontal accountability institutions enshrined in the, constitu uh, in the Constitution, today, the focus has shift, shifted from that. We are talking about diagonal accountability, where the media, civil society, communities play a watchdog role. In what holding the government Please. accountable. We have to take a break at this point. When we come back, I'll be asking Doc, what can we do so that the banks in Ghana can reduce their rate? When you go and pick a loan, you can pay a minimal interest on your loan. You're watching PM Express. We will be back. Well, welcome back. You're watching PM Express. My guest is Professor Gottfried Bokping. We are talking about interest rates and other related matters. A lot of jargon, but 
absolutely necessary for our understanding of how the economy works and operates. Prof, before we went on the break, we were talking about the inefficiencies that we transfer to consumers. When I heard Deputy uh, Power Minister at the time, um, John Jinapo, say that we are buying power from Ivory Coast because it is cheaper to buy power from Ivory Coast than to produce at the time in Ghana. I was surprised. Why are the Ivorians producing power at a cheaper cost than we are? It's very simple. It's down to inefficiencies. Uh, and the inefficiency here, we are looking at it from three layers, from generation. So we talk about generation losses. Mm -hmm. That is above what is normal. We are talking about transmission losses, which is also above normal. Beyond that, we're also talking about distribution losses from ECG's point of view. That is also above. OK. Yeah. If I may set a crude example in the hope that it will bring us better understanding. Say we are in the production of cars. Let's say the power is their cars. Yeah. So At the production level, instead of producing 100 cars, even though you put in material and money to produce 100 cars, you produce 90. And you are moving the cars okay. to say, okay. let, let, let. Fine. You have a point there, but let's also look at it this way. Mm -hmm. Your job is to produce mm -hmm. and get it to the other person. Okay. You produce 100, but you are only able to get 60 to the other person. So it means that out of what you have generated, you couldn't pass, take all of that mm -hmm. to the to person. The, okay. You've actually lost 40. 40. But now, in your pricing, even though you were only able to get 60 to the other person, your attempt is to recover the, the cost, cost of, of the all producing the hundred by being by making only sixty available. So the person who is paying for the cars is actually going to pay for the hundred cars, yeah, even though, though the person is receiving sixty. That, that, that is what it means. And if you don't want to do that, then the government must come in and subsidize. So that is why we are paying more for power than our neighbors yeah. in Ivory Coast in Burkina Faso. Yeah, there's something else we need to just open our eyes to: our installed capacity. I'm told it's over 5,000 megawatts. megawatts yes. As an economist, I don't know how a megawatt looks like. <laughs> I don't know the size or whatever. Okay. Granted, mm -hmm. uh, um, our peak demand, I'm told, is around 2,500 yes, or so yes. megawatts. The and highest is 2,000, I think 2,800. Yeah. Fine. But we are unable to convert our installed capacity because the installed capacity represents investment mm -hmm. cost to the nation. But we are unable to translate all of that into actual. That is dead weight in the, in the system. So with that level of inefficiency and that uh, 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 underutilization, there is no way you can talk about realistic or economic price. Because in economics, you can only talk about realistic price at a certain efficiency level. Other than that, I mean, you so you are saying we have bought equipment and tools and, and things to that, be able to produce 5,000 megawatts, megawatts of power. But, but we are only able elicit just, let's say, approximately 50%. And yet we have spent the money yes, to procure these yes, things that should that. give us 5,000. So now, you know the, the current Minister of Energy talked about the fact that uh, by 2020, Jaku. Yeah, Ghana will start exporting power. Yeah, former President Mahama said that yeah, too. Yeah, yes, also said that. Yeah, my, my, my worry is at what price are we going to export this? So if our prices are not competitive, competitive then probably Benin may exercise the option of buying from Ghana or from Cote d'Ivoire or elsewhere that it could be what? It could be cheaper. So that is why, in fact, as we speak right now, there are certain firms in this country. They only call themselves manufacturing firms, but they, in practice, they are not. They import the, 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 the goods or the items and only put a local logo on it because they have found that when they set up the production here, it makes them ineffective. And competitive because and the cost of production will be precisely. high. Precisely. So when they, they bring it from outside and repackage, they are able so to... So let's talk about price. money from power. Let's talk about money. Why is it that when my cousin in Ivory Coast borrows money, mm -hmm. the highest he or she will pay is, say, 4%. When I borrow money in Ghana, just across the border, I am paying something in the region of 30%. Why? OK, fine. So there are a number of factors that determine interest rate. 
one can be the policy rate. Inflation is also very important. So when you compare inflation in Ghana to inflation in Côte d'Ivoire, you see a big difference. Your interest rate wouldn't be lower. You understand that? It, will, it won't make sense that way. Again, there are a number of other factors also. Government's own appetite for borrowing in the domestic market also plays a role in higher interest rates and all of that. So, and then you're also looking at operational costs of, 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 of banks and, and firms in Ghana compared to uh, those in, in Africa. So when, so when they put all these things together, and then you're also looking at the, the cost or the rate at which banks are mobilizing deposits in Ghana here compared to the rate at which they are mobilizing deposits, let's say, uh, in Côte d'Ivoire. And then you're also looking at exchange rates. You know, over the years, you'll find that the, the CFA franc is more stable. Okay, because the, it's backed by the economies of the Francophone yeah, okay. countries. Okay, like I said earlier, that the CD depreciates only in a ref, in, in a reflection, or it's a reflection of the of what what is it that is backing the CD? It's just a small open economy where more than seventy percent of business input cost in this country is imported. You understand? And once that happens, then any variation in the currency, right? Would, would, would be absorbed through the production channel and passed on to the customer at the end of the day. So the point is that, yes, we, and then also, you know, one key requirement for inflation targeting to be effective is physical discipline. Mm -hmm. Over the years, we, we, we have denied the central bank the necessary physical discipline. That would have enabled them to effectively deploy monetary policy to bring down inflation, okay, and then engineer growth even though bringing down inflation may not seem uh, that user-friendly for a lot of people. Low inflation itself is desirable. Okay, so, so the public in the public sector, i.e. the political authorities, yes. the discipline with which they raise money and spend the it... Money has implication even for monetary policy conduct. And for that reason, the rate at which you borrow, you may not have benefited directly from the physical side, but their actions and inactions have a wide-ranging or pervasive impact in the lives of everybody. That is why you find that, uh, to some extent, we, we supported the IMF program because not because of the money that we'll get. How much is 918? Yeah, it's 918 million dollars. How much is that? I mean, That's less than a billion, and we had taken several euro bonds I mean, Billions euro bonds. But the reason we all supported it was that uh, the IMF program was going to ensure some level of physical discipline on the side of government, especially in the run up to the election. Because the reason why we found ourselves in this situation largely has to do with how we conducted ourselves during the 2012 election. Mm -hmm. And as we speak, with, with, I can tell you that Ghana has not fully recovered from the election excesses of 2012. Wow. And then we went into 2016 as well. Because it, it was the election excesses and the indiscipline on the, 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 the physical relaxation and the monetary accommodation that uh, surrounded the 2012 elections. Were the reasons it was massive. We, yes, was the reasons, were the reasons why we had to go for the IMF program. So if you check the, if you look at the IMF program, one key uh, objective of the IMF program is the elimination of physical dominance of monetary policy. Okay. Uh, let me break it down. Absolutely. So, <laughs> <laughs> so mm. in other words, it, it, we know that for inflation targeting, it will only be effective if physical discipline is preserved. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are going to put in place certain stringent measures that would enable Ghana government to spend within its means or within its budget, will not go all about so, physical slippages or if you spend in excess of your projected expenditure, you have worried the market. Our problem also has been that the destinations of these expenditures do not necessarily uh, in near to our to the benefit, benefit of the productive sectors of the economy. And as a, the average politician will spend to get food than to increase production or something. So. These are a number okay. of issues that I, I want to believe. Am I understanding you to be saying, over the years, we have behaved like the boy whose father, when he, they gave him money, will go to school, squander all of the money, go and borrow more, and then when the father gives him money, he can't actually pay for his debts yeah. 
because he's taking the money and he's misapplying it. Yes. Now his uncle has to step in yeah. and, and now and take the money. Whenever the father gives him money, he'll go and give it to his uncle. Then his uncle will keep the money and regulate how he spends it so that he doesn't run out of money yeah. and then go and borrow yeah. and then he's in debt. And, and, yeah, and, and in addition to that, now they tell you that previously you used to report to only your father. Now report to your headmaster. Okay. Which is, let me put that, let's say that is the IMF. So in addition to being transparent to Ghanaians and parliament and all of that, the Ghana government will have to be transparent to the IMF, supply regular update, okay, which is necessary. So the so IMF has become headmaster with yeah, a cane. They come here and do, in, in, uh, I, what we call in the invest interim assessment. Uh, yeah. They come do their review and then they say you have passed. Then they release some small money to you. Unbelievable. <laughs> but we, we needed to do this because we felt that uh, the government would take the IMF more serious than they take Ghanaians. And because the IMF has got that clout to actually ensure that governments or nations pay more attention to So why did we advertise the going to the IMF as some great achievement? We went there because we needed help. And I'm not too sure how we can celebrate that. Uh, even though we are a member of the IMF and all of that, it's not compulsory to, to go to them. But of course, it makes the IMF also happy because we have made them more re relevant in the world than the developed countries. So we mess up <laughs> and go to them and say, okay, now come and uh, the, those who sing will say, come and take their stare. Yeah, they help us. I mean, um, the IMF has been useful to us. I've heard a lot of people criticizing them. They've also had the uh, downside and all of that. If you look at the number of the reforms that we boast about today, they came as a result of IMF World Bank reforms. Yeah. Talk about the Public Financial Management Act mm -hmm. and all of that. Talk about the New Bank of Ghana Act. Financial and Administration and Act. Act and all those things. So, but is that not where the problem lies, Prof? We pass these laws. When the IMF moves out, we hold the laws in abeyance. Yeah, we, ha we have a public procurement act. The abuses of the public procurement act are well, uh, uh, procurement act are well documented. Yeah, I mean, our laws are observed more in breach than in compliance. The enforcement aspect of our laws are very weak. Not that we have good laws. I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding of the system, the regulatory framework and all of that, in the literature, we interact with the law and all of that. And if we are able to enforce them, okay, without fear or favor, we would do well. But Ghana has a problem that we have to be able to deal with. And, and, and the way to do so is to hold government accountable. The way to do so is to explore efficiency. There's a limit to how far the central bank can go in reducing interest rates. There's a limit to how far the banks themselves can also go. It has to be seen as a collective effort, both from the borrower point of view, the supplier point of view, the regulator point of view, and the government also. Once we are all doing our part and complementing each other, our efforts and all of that, we should be seeing rates coming down because I am quite hopeful because we have been there before. Uh, inflation at the end of uh, 2010 was 40.8 percent. We brought it down. Brought it down. The, I mean, at the end of 2000. Yeah. 2000. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we went through HIPAA. Mm -hmm. Remember, Ghana's yes. debt to GDP ratio at the end of 2000 was more than 100 percent. We went through HIPAA. Finished that in 2004. We went through the multilateral debt relief initiative, finished that also in 2006. Our debt to GDP ratio came down significantly. It will also interest you to know that during that period, Ghana was under an IMF program called the Poverty Reduction and Growth Facility. Mm -hmm. But Ghana decided to exit. We decided to exit the IMF program, and which paved the way for us to, to, to issue our first euro bond. bond. Uh, in 2007, 2007, the 750 euro bond. Unfortunately, the resilience of our economy, okay, wasn't that strong. So the global crisis, 2007, 2007. 2008, world oil prices that escalated and all of that, I mean, and slamming commodity prices, essentially brought us to our, our knees. Then we have to make a U-turn less than, I think, two years or so. We have to make a U-turn in 2009 when we went for an IMF program. But you also realize that during that period, we, we, we even achieved single digit inflation. Yes, for, for, for a sustained period yeah, of time. I mean, and, and, and we were all happy. The government took the credit for it and all of that, except that 
Uh, whilst inflation was single digit, exchange rates couldn't complement that. Mm -hmm. So interest rate had go up and all of that. So we, we didn't really feel the benefits of that. But of course, we, we have evidence to that. So it means that we, we do know, because we have been there before, and, and once we're able to sustain this effort that the government is putting in place, and then the central bank, civil society playing their part, the media and all of that, we should be seeing that things, as we speak right now, you can see that things are moderating a bit, coming down a bit, even though it's not at the pace that we, we would have been happy uh, with. But it, 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 it's something So let's talk inflation, interest rate. Are you seeing policies, actions, steps being taken by government that give you some hope? that we can bring these things to that level that you just spoke about, the 2001, 2006, those mm -hmm. actions that brought us to a level where you could be excited that the government was no longer borrowing domestically and treasury bill rates had fallen mm -hmm. substantially. Yeah. Are you seeing steps that will lead us to that level again, that we can be hopeful that subsequently things would normalize? Um. I've seen certain steps as to whether it's adequate to get us immediately to where we want to get to. No, because there are constraints to how far they can go beyond that. You will realize that there's something that the Ministry of Finance is doing with the reprofiling of our public debt, debt yeah. by extending the maturity profile. Once they do that, they begin to free up immediate liquidity. That brought in the recent 2.25 billion. billion which is uh, so what that should help us is that the extent to which they borrow more short term would go down. Once that happens, we do not expect that treasury bill rate would would go up significantly. Even though in the 2017 budget, the government indicated that they will not do euro bond, the the manner, uh, the strategy they have chosen to operationalize their uh, their borrowing strategy is to open it up to foreign investors. So even though they issue domestic bonds, they are still are able to attract foreign... Is that good or bad? To some, it has its own good side and then the bad side. Any decision that you take is just like taking a medicine. Okay. You understand that? I mean, it has its own side effects and all of that. But at the end, if you put in place the right measures, you'll be able to contain the side effect and preserve your health. Okay. Rather than saying that, okay, and you wouldn't say that just because this medicine has a side you won't effect, take it. I just won't take it mm. or something. So those are the issues that I want to believe that government will have to be able so to So with this decision to reprofile the debt, but then allow foreign participation, we know that Franklin Templeton bought yeah. a large chunk of the, yeah. the um, recent bond. So, you know, I mean, government was in a hurry also to some extent because the city was depreciating in those, in those periods. So they needed these uh, dollars. As, uh, uh, they needed it like yesterday. Okay. You understand that, and therefore, because uh, with just that uh, transaction, our 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 reserves increased significantly, and that was necessary to ensure that speculative activity is not entrenched in the market. Because once speculators get to see that your international reserves has gone up, the central bank has got more arms in that area to defend the currency, they wouldn't want to operate. So we've seen the effect of all of that together with the policy prescriptions in the budget and the market confidence, the goodwill, all playing a part. So we've seen that in terms of the performance of the CD, it, it, it's, it's different. From so you say it some, achieved the purpose? Uh, to some extent. But the, the next question is whether it's sustainable. Okay. You understand? And that is why I'm saying that a, a single policy intervention in the system is insufficient to address our problems. We are looking at it holistically. So if you realize there's something else that the government is doing, I think the previous government started it to some extent in terms of the restructuring of the energy sector levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so once they do that and they successfully issue those bonds, it will free up immediate liquidity for the banks. Then they can do proper financial intermediation. And once government is not borrowing actively from them, nobody will advise the banks to look for the private sector businesses and lend to them. 
We were all in this country, I think somewhere 2004, 2005, 2006, and even some part of 2011, where banks were actively calling businesses. To come and pick to, loans. To come and pick loans. That is where we need to get to and sustain it. Once banks begin to pick their phones and they are calling people for loans, what it means is that the bargaining power has been transferred from the banks to the borrower. Now the borrower can then say that your rate is high. That is why I'm not picking your call. So if you want me to pick your call, what Bring would you down do? the rate. You lower the rate. That is how the bargaining is done. That is why we talk about forces of demand and supply determining rate. And when we talk about these forces, these are not witches or wizards. I hope you understand. When you lift the veil, you get to see the number of... <laughs> we have to take a break <laughs> at this point. When we come back, I'll be asking Prof, when does he expect this to happen again? That banks will chase people and we can hope that the interest rate will fall. You are watching PM Express. We will be back. We are watching PM Express and today we are talking about money and why money is expensive in Ghana. When you borrow, why is it so expensive? Dr. Godfrey Bokwin. Professor Godfrey Bok Bokwin is giving us some, because you were a doctor before you were a professor. Yeah. I'm struggling to no, move on. No, no. <laughs> you know? that in academia, we say titles carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so he's giving us an education as to yeah. um, why money is expensive, why borrowing is expensive in Ghana. You were talking about those glorious days when banks were chasing people. Do you see that happening anytime soon? And f before you answer that, why did we lose that? We lost that largely from the physical side. Yeah, Ghana's problem is largely as a result of physical indiscipline. Are we inherently undisciplined? Well, a number of factors will come to play, and I'm, I'm not sure I have... Do I'm we have a higher to propensity to be undisciplined in terms of managing money? I think that the, the, the structures have been designed to accommodate a certain level of indiscipline. That's a very diplomatic way of putting it. <laughs> And, that way, okay. and I, will, I, will, I will even look at it also from our constitution. I'm not a lawyer, but if you look at um, the way we've structured our governance, I think it's something we have to take another look in terms of the high concentration of power. In the hands of the executive. The executive and also the, the kind of relationship that there should exist between the executive, the judiciary. And the legislature. The, the legislature. Because if you pay me to what extent, I mean, and all of that, I want to believe that um, we've, we've, we've experimented with this constitution for a while, and uh, this government is in a better position to, to, to initiate long-lasting reforms that will benefit this economy, beyond just what we have seen in the budget and all of that. Do they have the motivation to do that? You know, the motivation is higher when they are in opposition, because they are not the beneficiaries. But when you are in power, and you are the beneficiaries of all of this, you tend not to, to take, you understand that, and all of that, but I, I expect this government to, to rise up beyond their own interests and look at the broader common good. And therefore, because um, ultimately, we, we need to do that because um, to guarantee private sector leadership, uh, infrastructure investment, the necessary productivity enhancing and all of that, they have to be backed by right uh, legislative framework, I mean, and uh, the legal framework and all of that. So Less for me the things that they should do, that <clears throat> when we see those things done, we can be hopeful that interest rates will come down, that we can borrow at levels where we can pay with ease. Yeah, one. Physical side, physical policy, physical discipline. It has to be sustained. It doesn't have to be a 12 month issue and then the government gives up, okay? And sometimes the incentive to give up is more higher towards the next election, you understand? So you realize that uh, physical discipline, monetary policy are a little bit effective in between elections. And then we use the election to destroy whatever gains that we have had. So once the government is able to sustain that, and, and when we talked about revenue administration, we are talking about the efficiency in revenue collection also. Block all those leakages. Are we inefficient in collecting revenue? We are inefficient. We are inefficient. There are empirical evidence that suggests that tax evasion and all those things. Collusions. And all of that. And I can tell you that all those leakages, they don't go into the CEO. They go directly into individual pockets. 
and all of that. Okay. So these are things that I want to believe that the government will have to focus on. And to do that successfully, they must look beyond vested interests and all of that. You may find that some of the people who are doing this are also party members. And then you realize that the government is constrained as to how far they can go. Because when they steal the money, some of it comes to the party. Also, or, some, or maybe you know somebody who knows this or who knows that and all of that. So sometimes you even realize that even in the system, genuine people who want to pursue the common interests of this country are frustrated, I hope you understand that, yeah. by, by, by the system. Because there's a, there's a kind of a clique, there's a kind of a, a well-rehearsed uh, system that protects and preserves these kind of things. Otherwise, we wouldn't have experienced it over the years for that long and all of that. I'm so, not advocating for the kind of things we saw in the time past by killing uh, people on the back of maybe whatever, but we have to make institutions work. And institutions would only work with credible people. Okay. So you are saying physical discipline, it's very, very plugging important. of the loopholes. Yeah. And then when we generate the revenue, the next aspect or the other aspect is the expenditure. Okay. Not only in terms of spend, but we must explore efficiency in our expenditure also. Contract of evaluation project delays and all of that. If Ghana government is building a three classroom block and they give you the price, it's as though they are importing the bricks from heaven or something, I don't know whether it will be that expensive. It's outrageously expensive. Even the estate crisis is putting up for us. I'm not too sure they are that expensive. I mean, so and yeah, that's how much we spend to build yes. a common classroom. A common classroom. So once it happens that way, then it means that we are not spreading growth or our expenditure effectively and we are not exploring efficiency. Because if you could build uh, 12 classroom blocks with the same amount and you end up only putting up three, that will not even last for long. Then it means that we are not making the right progress. All over the world today, nobody is talking about having more money. Everybody is talking about efficiency. The little that you had, what did you do with it? Mm. What was the level of efficiency? That is what is making gains today. Because the, the, the challenge in expanding your revenue envelope it's a bit more difficult today. That's what I was asking but you, you can earlier. Make more gains by exploring efficiency. And in this country, it's on record, and everybody knows we are not doing That's that. I was asking whether we have a higher propensity to be undisciplined in terms of our in terms of the way we manage money compared to say our neighbors in Burkina Faso in an Africa's and all of that. Because of course I get the fact that their currency is tied to stronger economies. But are they not more disciplined in even their pricing? Well, I haven't done enough studies in that area. But I do know that in the developed countries, okay, the, the, the system works, institutions work, and all of that. And all of that also helps to ensure tr the e efficient transmission mechanism in the whole system. Let me just give you an example. In this country, the kinky seller can increase the price of the kinky, and nobody will ask him or her a question. Or reduce the size of the kinky at will, or the quality of it. Free market. Yeah. Anybody at all can make any kind of profit in this country and can get away with it. Do we, that is not the way to go. You but you're not advocating you price control. No, certainly not. But consumer protection is weak. That's essentially what I'm, 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 I'm driving at. We have to be able to strengthen our consumer protection laws and enforce them. It's very, very important. If you don't do that, certainly, I mean, I mean uh, you can't do that elsewhere. I mean, in the US, I mean, those serious countries, you cannot do that. I mean, somebody should be evaluated. Look, you make a call in this country. And even when you have ended the call, you are, you are struggling hard to cut the core, and your, your credit is going. And you can't cut Sometimes it. Sometimes, out of anger, I switch it off just to preserve my credit. And it's not your fault. It's, not my fault. it's neither your phone. I have finished making my core. I want to cut it. Why should that be a struggle? <laughs> you understand that? Core quality and all of that. I mean, so beyond just the macro levels, we have to be able to ensure that consumer protection is very, very strong. And once you do that, the market will respond. The market to respond. So uh, I expect the government to do that. And I want to believe that they are very much aware. And I, I recently there was a discussion on that, on consumer protection mm -hmm. and all of that. Okay. And I, I'm also very hopeful because um, I, haven't, I haven't lived long 
that, that for, that for, for, for that long, but I've seen a shift in terms of media practice. The media is getting more involved, and there's a little bit of a specialization now. So you find that people take time to investigate issues and bring them up. In the time past, you used to find one or two people who are virtually on every network talking from inflation to deflation to everything. Uh, <laughs> okay, and I said, I okay. Once we've seen all these things, and we've also seen civil society doing very, Being very well. more active. Yes, I mean, not all of them, but a, quite a good number of them are doing evidence-based uh, 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 advocacy. advocacy in the system, the Imanis and the others. Okay, the, so once we, we begin to see all these things taking shape, and all of that. Everybody is trying to preserve their space in the economy. We should expect that politicians will respond. Uh, and it might not be that immediate, but I think that the fact that we are taking the right steps, and if we are able to sustain it, should give us some encouragement. As the docility of the Ghanaian emboldened the politician to engage in reckless behavior that then creates a mess for everyone. Well, it's, 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 from where I sit, it's a bit difficult to to, to blame only the politicians. My little understanding, I'm not a sociologist, um, my little understanding is that what happens in that small society, in governance, is a true reflection of what happens in a larger society down there. These people came from us. If we were all thieves and we were electing a, le a leader, we probably So we have the leaders we deserve. <laughs> I believe in that to some extent because there's a beautiful story in the Bible that I always make reference to. Um, a group of people asked Jesus Christ, where did you get your power from? And answer to that question was, John the Baptist, where did he get his power from? The people were confused. One, they, they, they said that if they say it's from God, he will ask them why they didn't believe in John the Baptist. Then if they say it's not from God, they were afraid of the people because the people regarded John the Baptist as a man of God mm -hmm. and the people who stoned them in other words, they will kill them. Mm -hmm. For that reason, they choose not to talk. What it means is that politicians can respond to what society is asking for. What is it that we are asking for? Are we asking for honesty? Are we asking for integrity? We do know in this country, people with all kinds of background, okay, but they still go and stand as MPs. And we vote for them. And we go and vote for them. So then it means that the incentive to, to do the right thing probably is low. And when they get into power, they have lifestyle change Changes overnight. And, all of them. and we and, worship them. Yeah, and we worship them. And we are not asking the quality of the money they have made. It's good to make money, but the manner in which you make the money, people should equally be interested. You understand that? Because it's, it's important. All over the world today, companies make profit, but the manner in which companies make their profit is also under scrutiny. You can't do so by exploitation. We talk about child labor. In our part of the world here, it may not be an issue, is that not so? Yeah. But elsewhere, child labor could be the reason why they will not buy your product. And then companies are doing corporate social responsibility today and all of that. Okay, so I think that there has to be a bigger response rather than just looking at the, policy, the politician at the top. They change it because they do. They, they also know because they came from us. They are one of us. We were together. We were in schools together. We were in the lecture room together. They were not they were not different from us. Prof, it's been great. I have been enlightened. I believe you have been enlightened too. We've been talking to Professor Gottfried Bokwing, head of finance, University of Ghana Business School. He's an economist. He's been giving us some education on what Ghana should and can do to change this insane situation where you borrow money and you pay insane amount as interest. Um, Machete, beautiful one. Call Latida, 0204-336-444, 0204-336-444. Latida, give me beautiful shed. Get the mantle. We bring you another exciting discussion on PM Express. My name is Malika Bastabu. Bye-bye.